Hello everyone, we're just about to start. So this uh, this week's topic, so it's the first for year two, it's going to be about head, neck and neuro. And we're starting with the throat by popular demand, because that's what people requested the most. So it's pharynx, tonsils and where fish bones get stuck. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Um, so starting off, I'm just going to go through the contents. So we're going to have an overview of the anatomy, so the pharynx. We're going to look at the nasal cavity and nasopharynx, the oral cavity and the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, and finally the tonsils. We're also going to go through some sample questions, and we're going to have a question and answer time where you can submit your questions uh, through the link that I put in the chat and you can submit them anonymously or through the live chat and I'll have a look through them and we can, I'll answer them as I go. So let's begin. So we're going to be talking about this picture here. Um, everyone's famous. Uh, everyone knows this picture. This is um, of the pharynx, the interior of the pharynx. And, this is, and we're going to guide you through what you need to know and what the different anatomy is. So let's start with the pharynx. So the pharynx is split into three different parts. So we have our oropharynx, our laryngopharynx, and our nasopharynx. So this is just another view of the picture here. And all of these three components make up the pharynx. It's just it has three different parts. The laryngopharynx can also be known as the hypopharynx. And the definition of this hypopharynx is just basically where the larynx would start. So this is where the larynx is. The laryngo pharynx is different from the larynx, it's a separate entity and should not be confused. So let's start with the nasopharynx. Where does it originate? So it originates where the nasal septum finishes. So we have our nasal cavity, nasal septum, and that's where it finishes and that's our nasopharynx right there. And the end of this is the lower extent of the soft palate. So we have our soft palate right here. This is where the soft palate ends. Different diagrams draw it differently, but we see our soft palate here, and that's where it ends. And that's the end of the nasopharynx and the start of the oropharynx. Now, the importance of the nasopharynx is that it dictates the passage of air, right? So we start through the nostrils, we go into the nasal cavity here, and then finally through the nasal septum, and eventually into the nasopharynx. And the air goes down to the oropharynx and uh, laryngopharynx and into our larynx and therefore trachea. Moving on to the oropharynx. So the oropharynx, as we've said, it begins where you have the loft, left lower edge of the soft palate. So if you look at it here, it's the lower edge of the soft palate. And from there on, we have the oropharynx. Then um, we have another entry into the oropharynx, which is through the oral cavity. So it's oral cavity to oropharynx, and it's via the palatoglossal fold. And when you have a sore throat, it's usually an issue of the oropharynx rather than anything else. You might have some, some bacteria or something in your nose, and it drips down and gets into your throat, and that's how you get a sore throat. Moving on with the laryngopharynx. So the laryngopharynx, it, or the hypopharynx, it originates at the tip of the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is what's used for swallowing. It's this little small thing that closes down like so. And when it closes, um, it's to, so that we can swallow. And when it's open, we breathe through it. And it becomes the esophagus, the laryngopharynx becomes the esophagus at C6 vertebra. So this is something quite important to remember, that it becomes the esophagus at C6. So there might be a question, um, when does the esophagus begin? It's at the C6 vertebra. So the epiglottis here sort of serves as the gateway between the larynx and therefore your throat and your esophagus. And this all happens in the laryngopharynx. Okay, moving onwards. Uh, we'll talk about the nasal cavity a little bit. So let's have a look at the picture here, um, the famous picture. And what we're talking about is this part here. This is the nasal cavity. Now, let's begin. So the nasal cavity has certain boundaries. The roof 
is your nasal bone. So this here would be your nasal bones. The posterior part is here would be your sphenoid bone. And the floor is the hard palate. Now, interestingly, the hard palate and soft palate are two different things. So the hard palate is a bony palate with a mucous membrane. And the hard palate is part of the base of the skull and it's comprised of two bones. Whereas the soft palate is a little extension that hangs at the end of the hard palate. And it's made of both skeletal and fibrous tissue. So it's a, it's a little bit different. We have next the nasal septum. So the nasal septum, it's between the nasal cavity and the roof of the heart palate. And essentially what it does, it, the original point is where it inserts into our palate and it splits our nostrils, right? It's, it's, we have two nostrils and it splits it in two. And the composition is part cartilage, part bone. So the first part of it, if you, if you can think about it, where we have our nose, right? So we imagine it's a nose there, and this is the nasal septum. The first part, here right the first part would be cartilage and this would be bone so this is bone and this would be cartilage so if you think about it the nose initially it's a cartilage cartilaginous and then it eventually becomes bone the purpose is to divert air right and because we have two nostrils it increases the surface area and can help humidify the air and make the air a bit warmer when it reaches our lungs so that's the point uh, and the purpose of the septum the, the reason for the septum is because also embryologically we develop from that when we develop the face, that's what the, nasal, the septum is as well. But most importantly, it, it keeps, it connects the heart palate to the, um, to the nasal bones. Okay, moving on. So we have the nasopharynx. So if we look at the nasopharynx as the nasal cavity, uh, plus nasopharynx, so this would be the whole thing here. But the nasopharynx itself would be this area, I'll just use a different marker here, would be this part right over there. And the importance of this is that we see um, several parts of the tonsils and recesses are found in the nasopharynx. In fact, the vast majority of them, are, or the largest ones, are found in the nasopharynx. Now, here we have some important things. We have the uh, auditory tube or the eustachian tube. And the eustachian tube connects all the way to the ear. So if you imagine your ear, right, that's the pinna. And we have an auditory canal. And we have your ossicles here. Well, you have an eustachian tube which goes directly um, from the nasopharynx. Now, the composition of this tube, so this is the tube here. Composition of this tube is that it's cartilaginous and becomes bone. So as it enters the middle ear cavity, it goes from cartilage to bone. So we're seeing a bit of a pattern here. Same with the nose, it starts as cartilage and eventually becomes bone. And the reason for this is, is that the deeper you go into the skull, the more likely you're to encounter bone. And you have the cartilage around it, which needs to be a bit more bendable because you're inside someone's mouth or someone's you know, outer ears. But in the inside, you want it to be hard and protective. So that's why you have bone. Now, the function is to allow air into the middle ear cavity. Now, why do we need this? Well, the mucosa gradually resorbs the air as it exists in the ossicles, right? So the ossicles vibrate, the, the mucosa needs the air, right? So they resorb it and you need new air. Now, how do you get this new air is by yawning. So you yawn, it opens up the auditory tube and you get new air straight into the ossicles. And this is also when, for example, you have changes in pressure um, like let's say you go up a hill or you're up in a plane and you have the popping in ears. This is where that comes from. It's the fact that the pressure inside your inner ear is different than the outer pressure. And the eustachian tube, either by blowing your nose in a, something called a valsava maneuver or just swallowing a lot, will equalize the pressure. Because when we swallow, we press up and um, we change the pressures in the ears. Now we also have the pharyngeal recess. So the pharyngeal research sits very closely to the auditory tube. And basically it's also called the fossa of Rosenmuller. It's behind this, it's at the side wall of the nasopharynx and it goes as far as the base of the skull. And it goes to a point where the internal carotid artery is found and headed. And this is very important because if you want to do surgery up there or you have a cancer, 
you, you can invade this artery and it will be a low blood supply for the tumor. And if it gets there, it can invade the whole, um, the whole head. So it's a proper nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So it's the malignancy of the epithelium of the nasopharynx. It's found in this recess and this recess goes all the way into the internal carotid artery. So this is a very important thing to, uh, to remember for the exams. Okay, moving on. We're going to talk about the oral cavity and the oropharynx. So the oral cavity is from the tip of your lips to the back of your um, throat. And it, together, oral cavity is this part right here. That's your oral cavity and that's your oropharynx. Now, there are a lot of things here to go through. So we have two folds. We have the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal. Now, the glossal, glossal means the tongue, pharyngeal means the throat. So if, if we have a palatoglossal fold, it means it goes, it's a muscular fold, it goes from the palate, the soft palate, to the side of the tongue. Whereas if it's the palatopharyngeal, it goes from the soft palate to the side of the pharynx. And they have corresponding muscles. So you have the palatoglossus muscle and the palatopharyngeus muscle. As you can see, named after the folds. And they both have different functions. Uh, palatoglossal just helps the movement of the tongue. You know, it helps you make sounds. But most importantly, it's the palatopharyngeus muscle. Because what it does is, if you can have a look at it here, palatopharyngeus, it pulls it down, right? So it pulls on this fold, it pulls it down, and it towards the pharyngeal wall. Now, what does this do? So that's when we're drinking, you know, we do not want the water or you know, whatever we're drinking to go up our nose. And if this happens, well, then we wouldn't be able to breathe. We would start choking and it's not good. So what the body does here is that when we swallow or part of the swallowing mechanism, tongue lifts up and moves the soft palate. But at the same time, the palate or pharyngeus muscle also contracts and prevents drinks entering the nasal cavity. Now, sometimes if we like laugh or if we have hiccups, um, this doesn't work as well. And we might end up, or if we cough, we might end up not contracting this muscle. And therefore we might get some fluids going into our nostrils. And this is very uncomfortable. Um, and that's why we have this muscle to ensure it doesn't happen. Once again, the fold is composed of a mucosal fold and the muscle. So you have the muscle, which is lies very close to the fold and it just pulls on the fold. We then have the tongue, which is a series of muscles. You have extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. It's mostly innervated by um, cranial nerve 12, except for palatoglossus muscle. And then we have other features here, such as the epiglottis. So this is our epiglottis here. And it's made up of elastic cartilage and it meets the tongue. Now, the importance here is that it helps us with when we swallow. So if we eat something and we try to swallow, you know, try to initiate that first step of peristalsis, um, we do not want the food to enter our voice box and our larynx because that will enter the trachea and will choke. So what the epiglottis does during the swallowing uh, mechanism um, is that it closes over the larynx. So if you can imagine it here, we have our um, epiglottis and we have our larynx here, the opening to the larynx. And what happens is that it moves it down so that we can have food go through the esophagus, right? So it goes to the esophagus and everything is fine. Now, once again, if we choke and this doesn't happen or it doesn't work as it should, we start to choke and we start having a cough reflex. Now, we also have something called the vallecula. Now, the vallecula is this deep recess found between the tongue and the epiglottis. Now, the vallecula is not an organ, it's not anything, it's just the name of the recess, it's the anatomical term. It's called the vallecula, which means like a small little gap. And in this small little gap, food can get stuck, you can get popcorn kernels get stuck here. Um, in little children, you can get like little beads or toys can get stuck here, so this is where you get the soft choking. And it's very uncomfortable, and we clear it through by coughing. So it's the coughing which clears everything else by creating a lot of pressure to spit it out. Incidentally, this is also where when you use mouthwash and you gargle, that's where you sort of feel it when, when it stinks, it's in the follicula. Now we're going to go about the laryngopharynx. So the laryngopharynx is 
um, at the lower half. We've already talked about the location. It's between the epiglottis downwards. Um, but we have one thing here. We have the piriform fossa, which is this pear shape. It's on both sides of the neck. It's a pear shaped recess. It's also sometimes called a piriform sinus. It's in the mucosa. Now, if we have a look here, we have an actual drawing. So we have our tonsils, which we'll get to later. We have our different folds, our nasopharynx, laryngopharynx, and that's the throat. Now you see these pear shapes, so piriform means pear shape. So if I can convince you that this right here is pear shaped, then you might have an easier time remembering what it looks like. So it's like an upside down pear, if you can see it, so it'll be like this, and it goes down like that. Okay. And the significance of this is that stuff can get stuck here. You can get beads stuck here. You can get um, all sorts of food stuff here. Um, or if you choke on your spit, you can get that stuck here as well. So yeah, so that's this piriform recess. And the significance is that food stuck gets stuck there. And here's another view of the laryngopharynx. So it's this blue part here where we have the... Uh, the uh, the esophagus starting there, we have the larynx, and we have the epiglottis where it closes over. And see, we have the tongue. So that's just another view. Okay, so we, we've got this. Now we, let's talk about the tonsils. So we have several tonsils. Let's start with the tubal elevation. So that's, you know, it's just above the auditory tube. So that's why it's called the tubal elevation, which is basically the air that encompasses. And within that, you have the tubal tonsil. So these are paired. These are on both sides of your mouth. You have the adenoid, which is a singular tonsil, and it's also known as the pharyngeal tonsil. And this is what usually get removed because they get, they get swollen up in children uh, in pharyngitis. And the location is upper posterior wall of the nasopharynx. So it's quite high up, right? This pharyngeal tonsil is quite far up in the nasopharynx. We have palatine tonsils, which are, as the name suggests, inferior to the palate, and they're also pair, paired, and it means there's two of them, and they're so posterior to the tongue. And then we have the lingual tonsil, which is a singular tonsil, and that's behind the one third of the tongue. Now we have something called Waldier's ring, which is what all these um, tonsils are called when they're grouped together. And it's an interrupted ring of lymphoid tissue from naso to oropharynx. Now, this is a better view of this. So we, as you can see, we have the adenoid in the nasopharynx. And most people, you can just barely see it, uh, but you're not really supposed to. If it's inflamed, if, it, if you have pus there, if it's purulent, you might see that. You have these tubal tonsils. You can see they're quite small, but they get larger if you have inflammation. Palatine tonsils. So this is the, the signature um, pharyngitis. Um, it's where it's like infected and you can see the, the mucus coming out. This is both viral and bacterial. And then we have the lingual tonsil, which is at the base of the tongue. And then and normally you can't really see it unless someone's inflamed. Now, if we look at this on an actual person looking into their mouth, we can see that the adenoids would be here. Sometimes they can be a bit more pronounced and they might appear down there. We have their tubal tonsils. We have the palatine tonsils, which are visible at all times, and they become more inflamed um, when we see uh, some infections. And you also have the lingual tonsils, which sort of sits behind the tongue, which you don't really see. Okay, does anyone have any questions? If you do, just uh, submit them through. We're going to move on to some sample questions and model answers after this. Um, but yeah, just feel free to ask questions if there are any. So the first question we're going to uh, look at is going to be um, the bones, which make up the bone part of the heart palate. Uh, we got this question um, when I sat the exam, so that was a couple of years ago. And basically, I'm just trying to pull up questions here. Um, so yeah, we got this question a couple of uh, years ago. And we didn't know what it was. It is in one of the labs, uh, believe it or not. Um, it is there. Um, so you have this two bones. It's called the palatine process of the maxilla and the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. So what, what, what does this look like? So when you look at the skull, right, 
you'll have the maxilla, so it's the whole palatine bone. And then you have the horizontal portion of the palate bone. So it's two bones fused together and you have this transverse suture. And what this uh, does is that this serves as the bony part of the heart palate. Now the heart palate has two parts, right? So the heart palate has a bony, so that's bony, bony, and then there's a membrane or mucosa. So the mucosal part is just the mucosa that surrounds it, but the baseline of it is this hard bony structure. And then you will have your, um, your soft palate just behind it. Yeah. So you have your soft palate just behind it. So bony palate, um, palatine process of maxilla and horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Uh, next question. So where in the pharynx do fish bones get lodged most commonly? This is a stereotypical question that happens in you too. And in the oropharynx, you have the vellecula and in the laryngopharynx, you have the piriform fossa. So those are the two places where fish bones most commonly get lodged. And if we go back, you can imagine why, right? So you can have a bone stuck here or you can have it stuck in this piriform fossa. And as, you, as we saw from before, the bones can be stuck here, nice and easily here because it's a nice recess, it's a nice sinus. And in this fossa, you know, it's not only bones, but fish bones get stuck here. And if they get stuck in the piriform fossa, then you have to use some really big instruments to sort of all, reach all the way down there and take them out. It's not very comfortable. It's much easier if it gets stuck in the vallecula. Uh, if it gets stuck in the vallecula, you can just cough it up or just even pick it out yourself. But if it's in the uh, piriform recess, well, that's much more challenging and you need to go to A&E. Okay, let's just go quickly back to the question. Oh. Okay, I skipped too much there. But um, so what is the clinical significance of the pharyngeal recess? So the pharyngeal recess, as we said, it has the carcinoma, which means it's a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And it starts like this. So we have the nasal cavity here. We have the tongue and it spreads around. So this is just to show the spread of it. And it's called the malignancy of epithelium of the nasopharynx. And what we have here, is this is a fully grown tumor. It's a fully grown tumor. It can invade the cranial nerve, go to the hypopharynx, and it can even or get into the orbital parts of the eye. Of course, you can invade the cheekbone, and once you get into the bones, you can get to the entire blood supply. So as you can see, huge problem. Now, there's another clinical significance, and we've alluded to this before. So we have the malignancy. So, but how do you get to know what the diagnosis is? How do you differentiate between these cancers? As you can imagine, the pharyngeal recess is really far up. It's really far back. And so as you can see, you, would, you can imagine the arteries sort of flowing here. It's really difficult to find. So you need a biopsy to detect and to, to assess um, the degree of the cancer before it spreads out and gets to the whole of the face, right? Nobody wants wants to, um, you know, see a patient and suddenly, oh, like we could have prevented it if we did the biopsy. Well, the biopsy itself is very tricky. And the reasoning behind this is because the biopsy um, is often done blindly. So you use an endoscope to get a proper look, but even with an endoscope, it's a very difficult area. So you oftentimes just poking at it in a blindly, you're just hoping to find the tumor. This introduces its own problem because if you just poke blindly and you penetrate through the recess and you go all the way near the bone, well, now you're close to the internal carotid artery. And if you penetrate that, well, that's massive bleeding. So you have to be very, very careful not to damage the internal carotid artery. So the full answer to this question is, it's the malignancy of the epithelium or the nasopharynx. It starts at the pharyngeal recess. And the fact that the biopsies are normally done blindly, it's difficult to see. And the recess is close to the intercortical artery. And therefore you have to be very, very careful when you're trying to get biopsies, not to damage the internal carotid artery. So that's the full answer to this question. Now, we didn't get this question, but the year uh, before me did. And it was quite tricky. It is mentioned in the book. It is mentioned in Mr. McDonald's lectures. Um, and it is something that you should know. 
Moving on, what is the function of the palatopharyngeus muscle? So you have to think palatopharyngeus or palatoglossal. So palatoglossal is the one that's attached to the tongue, while palatopharyngeus is the one attached to the pharynx. So what does that do again? Well, if we can refresh our memory with a diagram, palatopharyngeus brings down the palate and enables um, the fact that it pushes it back to the wall of the pharynx, like so, and prevents entry of fluids um, into the uh, nasopharynx and nasal cavity. And that's what that does, puts the sulfide towards the pharynx and prevents the drinks. Now the palatoglossus, it pulls down the soft palate and this helps with initiating the process of swallowing. So you have to push down and then go back up. Also when you're taking a deep breath in and you push your tongue to the root of your mouth, um, this is also um, the function of the palatoglossus muscle. It's an intrinsic muscle of the tongue, sorry, extrinsic muscle of the tongue and what it does, it lifts the tongue up. Okay, so what is the function of Waldeyer's ring? Um, so let's have a brief recap what the Waldeyer's ring is. Um, so it's this interrupted lymphoid tissue and we have an adenoid, we have the tubal tonsils, we have a palatine tonsil and the lingual tonsil and if we can imagine, we look directly in a coronal section, it forms this ring. Now what is the function of it? So it's in the mouth, right? So the mouth is very important because it guards two places in the body. It guards the entry to the trachea, so that's through here, trachea, but also through the esophagus. So it has these two mechanisms. Now, you can get infections in the lungs, which is bad. So that's why if you have a cold or, you know, if you feel um, sick, or for example, if you get COVID, your tonsils will swell up and your, and your lymph nodes will swell up to sort of prevent entry and prevent microorganisms harming your intestinal tract and your respiratory tract. Likewise, any bacteria that might enter the, the stomach or the intestines, um, the Waldeyer's ring is there to block and def you know to protect it. So how does it do this? It's because um, the Waldeyer's ring has the innate immune system. So tonsils are innate immune system. However, uh, this means that they help. They have you have your DCs, you have your antigen presenting cells, all that stuff to capture the microorganism and deal with it. But it also helps trigger the adaptive immune system indirectly. So you have lymph nodes all around your face and we'll do a video about that later on. But these lymph nodes, they communicate with the tonsils and the tonsils activate, become activated you know, and they activate the antigen presenting cells, which are on the surface of the tonsils, which go to the B and T cells, which are found in the lymph nodes and they activate them and mount a response. So you can produce a humoral response, that's your antibodies, or cellular cytotoxic response through your T cells. So, yeah, so that's the function of the Waldeyer's ring. Once again, another common question. Okay, and what we have here is the unique features of tonsils. So I think that this was this is never quite well covered by the lectures. Maybe they've changed that recently, but I found this to be quite tricky. So tonsils have three features, or well, more than three features, but three key features are that they have a strategic location. So they're at the entrances to the digestive and respiratory tract. Well. All the microorganisms that you encounter in the world and the, in the air, they come in, you breathe them in, and that's where they're most likely to appear to enter the body. Secondly, it's a specific lymph tissue, right? It doesn't have afferent lymphatic vessels because afferent, just for a recap, means vessels coming in to the lymph tissue. It has efferent vessels that exist where activated antigen presenting cells, these are the cells which see the antigen, see the bacterium, they go to activate B and T cells, which are found in the tonsils, and also mostly other lymphoid tissues. So it's a specific lymph tissue. And there's this final thing, which have tonsillar crypts found everywhere except for the adenoids. And we're going to have a picture here. It's the one in green. They penetrate deep to the surface um, of the tonsil follicle. And what you see here, you have all these germinal tissues right here. And what they do is that these crypts are filled with white blood cells and any organism that you know gets here, gets detected, gets recognized and gets sorted. Or if they don't get sorted there and then with the macrophages, they send them down to other 
uh, other lymph cells to recruit more cells to help the issue. So to give a quick recap, strategic location, specific lymph tissue, which means that it is a sort of a hub where all the, all the nasty things come in and they detect them. Think of them as a sort of filter for the rest of the lungs. And certain tonsils have these crypts which penetrate down to the surface of the tonsil follicle. And basically that means they help activate the relevant cells so that, the, um, so that they can recruit more cells, come in and give the humoral or cellular response. So final question is how a sore throat can result in otitis media acuta. So we need to define our things. So otitis media acuta is your ear infections. This is acute ear infection. It's very commonly occurs in children, but it can also occur in adults. And there are many ways this can happen. So we have a sore throat, which, or allergies, or um, anything that can cause inflammation. So you have this inflammation and in response to all the to the pathogen or the inflammation itself the tonsils become bigger they undergo hypertrophy now the in the tubal tonsil if we think about the tubal tonsil it's wrapped around the opening to the auditory tube right so what happens is that it narrows because it becomes bigger and it occludes it so if i was to draw this out for you so we have the opening here the tonsil and this is the tonsil itself i'll do it in a different color green color right so we have inflammation so what happens when there's inflammation well when we have inflammation it squeezes it right it becomes so much smaller because of the pressure that it exerts outside so this diameter here becomes much more thicker and this thickness ensures that the that the tube itself is occluded so we said before that the function of the auditory tube is to um, equal the air pressure in the middle ear now if you don't have um, pressure in the middle ear you'll get a buildup of pressure this will be negative pressure so if we have negative pressure in the air because air can't leave in and new air can't come in and the reason it's negative air pressure is because the cells inside the middle ear um, they resorb the oxygen, they take it in. So if you take it, if you have an absence of oxygen or an absence of a gas, you build up negative pressure. So with the negative pressure, it, there's a problem because now that there's a negative pressure, the cells have leak out, transudate. So it's something called an effusion. And this is made up of, you know, like gunk from the cells, you know, they just leak out the cells' contents. Of course, at the same time, because you know you're not produced you don't have any air clearing out the area the goblet cells increase their mucus production and what happens is that you have this disgusting sort of gunky effusion mixed with mucus in the auditory tube which becomes a nidus for bacterial proliferation a nidus is just a way of saying a beautiful medium so it's ideal conditions it's it's anaerobic so there's no oxygen there it's um, it's an effusion and you have from the cells so it's the cell material and you have mucus so this is perfect place for bacteria to proliferate at the same time you also have uh, the fact that the mucus role of the auditory tube is to clear mucus that's produced so it goes both ways so the pressure causes leakage but also a lack of clearance of mucus and as you can imagine the middle ear can become quite irritated now in children, I'll just draw this out. In children, um, if we look at their ears, that's their ears, pretty big ear for a child. Um, and you have, you have your middle ear, so that's the middle ear. The eustachian tubes are very shallow, right? Which means that mucus has a much more difficult job leaving and therefore it accumulates here and eventually it can even backdrop into the, um, the middle ear. Now that's bad because that creates pressure on the ear and can cause all this inflammation. The, the consequence of all of this is that you have all this mucus, all these ossicles, so the bones of the ear, you have your three ossicles, right? 
and they can't move because they can't vibrate because of all the the air pressure, the negative air pressure, that's one thing, and the mucus and the effusion. So suddenly you have deafness. So a, f a full answer to this question would look like something like this. Um, we have uh, sore throat causes inflammation or any inflammation. Tonsils become bigger, create pressure in, in the air and in the middle ear. This is negative air pressure and you have the failure of the clearance of the effusion causes bacteria to proliferate. And in children, this is more common because of the different angle of the auditory tube. And finally, you can get uh, deafness where the ossicles can't move. Now, sometimes you can get perforation of the eardrum, which is very painful. Um, or you can cause the perforation with something called a paracentesis. So it's like a needle. You pop it and it releases the pressure and it allows communication with the air right here. So if you perforate this, the air can exchange through here. Um, the problem is, is if you have a perforated eardrum, that's not the best because that affects your ability to hear as well. But it provides um, relief. Now the treatment for this is that they don't usually recommend antibiotics. Although in practice that's very different because you have concerned parents and try telling them that you're not going to give the child antibiotics. It's very difficult. And sometimes antibiotic drops can help to um, if it's a bacterial cause. But most commonly it's viral and once you can have viral which becomes bacterial that can happen as well. That you start with a viral sore throat and then the bacteria gets in as an opportunistic infection. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, that's, that's the session right there. Um, if you, anyone has any questions, do let me know. You can type them into the, the, the document that I have set up in the chat. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, this video will be able to be replayed uh, later on, so it will be replayable. And uh, we'll give you a link to the material as well as a feedback link to see what, you want, what future videos you might want on different topics. So yeah, if you liked it, if it was helpful, you know, like it, subscribe it, you know, share with others, all that stuff. Um, we're trying to, you know, grow this channel, trying to see what you want. You know, this is a new thing that we're trying to do. And primarily we're going to be focusing on head, neck and neuro uh, because that was, that's what was most recently covered. But we will be releasing videos on, uh, on GI, on endo and on repro um, based on what you guys uh, feel that you need. And this will be a weekly thing. So every week on Thursdays, you'll have a session like this. So, so yeah, let us know if, if it was good or if it wasn't or what we could change. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question. Well, if you have any uh, other questions, you can just leave them in the comments here or message us directly through our, um, our Facebook page. And if you would find it useful if we had sample questions, so videos going over how to answer certain tricky questions or exam technique, uh, do let us know and we'll make videos about that. But yeah, thank you for watching and enjoy your break.